Welcome to part two of the video write-up from the cookbook challenge from the Boston Key Party CTF 2016. In this video, we will step through my exploit step by step and analyze it and see how it works. I will put the link of this exploit code into the video description. First of all, I define a couple of uh, important helper functions that are needed. The first one will uh, convert an integer to a string and then stui converts a signed integer to an unsigned one which is important receive all will just read bytes from the uh, socket until a timeout is reached and basically read everything i use send to send a, a string over the socket and then i also specify arguments that i can specify to either i connect to my local machine and uh, test it there or i connect to the remote service of the challenge and you can also see some global variables that i'm setting with certain numbers that are dependent on either my local setup or the remote setup namely offsets from libc which uh, why there is the libc provided with the cookbook challenge so that you can calculate the proper offsets when you leak addresses from libc and stuff like that. Then there are some heap helper functions, but we will look at them once we use them because they will take advantage of the functionality already. Well, and then we already get just to the start of the exploit. First of all, we will send uh, the name that they ask us for. It's not important. And afterwards, we actually start exploiting a first bug. We want to leak a heap address so we can calculate the exact location of the heap. To do with this, we allocate a recipe, we add an ingredient to it, which uh, allocates a new area for it, and then we free this recipe again, and then we still print it because it's a use after free vulnerability. And this leaks an address on the heap, which will have the deterministic offsets of this heap offset, so we know exactly where heap the heap is. Oh, this is also maybe a good uh, moment to check sec the cookbook. As you can see, it has annex enabled and it has canary, but it is not positionally independently executable. So the binary itself will not have ASLR and thus um, helps us a lot. But nonetheless, the system themselves might have ASLR and the locations where the heap is and the location where libc is will still be random. We can verify this by connecting to the SOCAD service that's executing the cookbook and then have a look at the memory layout of the process. And we can do this with the PROC um, file system. So we look at the memory map of the cookbook. In this particular case, you can now see that the here the addresses of the cookbook binary itself, but you can also see the heap and where libc is. So let's do it again and uh, look at the second execution of it, you can see that the addresses of the heap and the addresses of the libc changed, but the addresses of the binary itself are the same. So even though the binary um, doesn't use ASLR itself, the system uses it. So and the system will return an heap area that uh, will be random as, as well the libc and other stuff. Even though the heap location is random, it's still aligned. And if we malloc, like for example, if we malloc five items, the offset of those five items will always be the same. So when we can leak an address of the fifth item, for example, we can just subtract off the, the offset for all those five and get the base address of the heap. And that's basically what we want to do. We want to leak one heap address, which then we know exactly where the heap will be. So let's do exactly what my exploit is doing. First, we go into the create recipe menu. Then we press N for create a new recipe, which will allocate a new recipe on the heap. Then we will add an ingredient to it and we will add basil to it. And you know, the amount doesn't matter how many we, we add to it, but we can specify a number that we can see it in memory. And then we can print the recipe and we can discard the recipe and apparently if we print it again, we can leak some values. So how does this work? So let's have a look at a recipe in memory and especially what happens when we add an ingredient. And then of course also what happens when we delete the recipe but still print it again. For this, we just can take the global variable that holds the current recipe address so we can easily find where it is on the heap. At the start, obviously, there is no recipe, so it's zero. So let's continue and add a new recipe. This will allocate a new recipe on the heap and should set the global current recipe um, address. Okay, so apparently at this location, we have now a recipe. Doesn't look like much because at the start, it's all zero. We haven't filled the recipe with data yet. 
And as a next step, we add an ingredient to this recipe. In this case, I add just basil, which is one of the standard um, ingredients already included. And we can specify how many. The number and, our, and which ingredient doesn't matter, but we can choose numbers so we can uh, find them and easily recognize them again in memory. At the start of the recipe, there are now two new values and they look like heap addresses. So what are they pointing to? The first address seemed to point to somewhere where there is another pointer. So let's see where this is pointing to. And this looks like one of the ingredients, actually the basil ingredient. If you just print this address now, uh, the, the strings at this area, uh, you should notice that at offset 8 there starts the string of the basil and you can see it when you uh, print it as a string. And the other two values before it are the calories and the price. So the first pointer here is pointing to something else, which then has a pointer to the ingredient. And obviously if you reverse engineer and add multiple uh, ingredients, you will notice that the first pointer in the recipe will point to the start of a linked list. And the linked list will have two elements. It, the first one is the ingredient and the second element, which is here zero, is pointing to the next entry in this ingredient list. So when you add a new ingredient to a recipe, it will follow this linked list. At the moment, it's only one, uh, one ingredient in this list until it doesn't find a next ingredient, in this case zero. So if we would add another one at the location where there's a zero, we would get the address of the next ingredient entry after that one. The second pointer is very similar. It's also a linked list, but this linked list contains the amount of this particular ingredient. In this case, we I entered for 142 as the amount of basil. And if we would add another ingredient, like the previous linked list, we would get instead of the zeros uh, to the right of it, it would point to the next um, amount of ingredient entry, which will then also have an amount and again a next pointer, which is either zero or pointing to the next entry. Now we basically know how printing the current recipe works because as you can see it will display the name as well as the cost, the calories and the amount of the ingredient that we have entered and this 16706 is just hex 4142 which we have entered. And so now you know that when you print it, it simply follows those pointers. So for example for the amount, it follows the amount pointer in this linked list and the first entry and will print the first entry corresponding to the first ingredient in the other list. And this amount entry obviously has a second value zero, so there is no next ingredient at the end of the list, so it just stops their printing. The next step will be discarding this recipe, which will free the current recipe we are working on. But it doesn't reset the global recipe pointer that we are currently working on. So we can discard the recipe and still work with it. For example, we can still print the current recipe. Okay, now we have discarded it and now we can look at it in memory and we see that the two addresses that were previously pointing to the linked list are now different. Well, they, they are pointing to some, something weird. So this goes into how the heap is structured. And when you print uh, the this location minus four, you get the byte, uh, the four bytes just before this, um, this basically the start of your data. And that is actually heap metadata. This tells you how big this chunk is. And the two weird values are actually the forward and backward pointer uh, for this information which blocks are free and which blocks are still in use. And when we look at what they are pointing to, they point to the same location. This is actually another heap metadata storage somewhere else, not in this heap area, which basically tells you, in this case, it's telling you where the last block of the heap is, basically where the free data starts, which is available again for allocating new data. Now imagine what would happen if you would try to print this current recipe. It would try to follow those pointers and interpret them either as amount or as the, um, an ingredient. And in this case, if we print this now, you see that there are those weird values for the amount of the first not really existing um, ingredient. And the amount of this fake ingredient is obviously the value that was stored at the location where this um, heap metadata was pointing to. In this case, that is an address from the heap. It's actually pointing to the top chunk of the heap, basically where the um, completely free data starts, where you could allocate more. So this is an address on the heap that we can leak and 
and this defeats ASLR of the heap. Because when we print this now, we can then uh, just simply parse the output that we get, and that is what is happening here, to get the leaked heap address. So let's look at this more closely. With info proc mappings, we get the mapped memory for this process and we know where the heap is. So we know that this address is the heap. And we know this is the address that we leaked. So now we can calculate the offset between those two. So the leaked address will be hex 16d8 away from the start of the heap. And thus we defeat ASLR of the heap and now we know exactly where the heap is. After that I just remove the remaining ingredients because we don't need them. It's not necessary for the exploit particularly, but you cannot remove them now because otherwise the offsets on the heap will not be correct anymore. So I, in my case, I just removed them because I didn't want to uh, have them in the ingredients list when I'm dealing with the next bug. So let's look at the first step of the exploit. It apparently leaked the heap address 09A066D8. And we do it again, we get another address, and you can see always the offset at the end, the 6D8, is always the same. That's pretty cool. The next step of the exploit is we want to leak uh, a value from the global offset table, namely printf, so we can calculate off from f its offset where libc will be loaded, and thus defeating ASLR for libc. So what is the global offset table? When we just take a random function that is from libc, uh, from the program, for example, um, malloc maybe, we can see that malloc is here defined as jump to, and then again, a global variable in the data segment that uh, is a fixed address. So it will jump to the address that is stored there. And uh, that is basically the ad containing the address of the real malloc. When we look at this data section here, we can find actually a lot more entries, and this is called the global offset table. Because when you start the program, um, then the, the program itself does not know what the address of libc is. So the linker who tries to link the libc to this, uh, to this program will place the real address of malloc at this location here. So now the application just has to call this malloc wrapper, which then will jump to the real malloc location. And that's how it works. So if we can, and, and the address of the global asset table here are obviously fixed because the binary itself doesn't use ASLR. So if we can leak a value from this table, we know where um, libc will be loaded based on, the, based on knowing the offset of the uh, function uh, inside of libc. So let's have a look at uh, this in GDB. We um, run the exploit and then we detach GDB and we read the global offset table entry for printf. And that address that is contained there is the real printf. So we want to leak this f75cd280 somehow. So let's open libc in hopper. Now let's look for printf and then we can find the offset of printf inside of libc. And we can take the address of printf from the global offset table, subtract this offset, um, and then we should arrive at the lo location where libc is loaded to. And you will see at the start of the exploit that I have defined the offsets of printf and also system, which we will use later, based on the libc from my local machine. And obviously I've also added the offset of printf from the libc that was provided with the challenge. So in the next step of the exploit, we want to leak the global offset table entry for printf. And as you can see, um, that is here at location D010. And I use a different technique to do this. And once we have a leaked address of printf, we can subtract from it the printf offset and thus getting the base address of libc. So let's see how this looks like in the exploit. And it works nicely because uh, as you can see, we get a leaked address and when we subtract the printf offset of it, we get the libc base address. That looks pretty cool. We can do it again and we get a different uh, location because of ASLR. So that works very well. So let's dig into how exactly this leak works. So let's have a look at the add leak function that I've defined here. It takes as first parameter the address we wanna leak and then a second parameter it has called groom with hex 200. Uh, what that is we will see in a second. So the description says that this creates a recipe, discards it, and at its place it allocates a new ingredient, adds it to the ingredient list, 
And this ingredient list is basically this also a linked list like in the previous leak, but this time it's the global ingredient list of all the ingredients that we have added. So it's just abusing a different function. So first, if groom is defined, it will call a function called fill heap. So groom will fill up all fragmented heap chunks so we have a nice fresh aligned heap to start with. To do this it will have a for loop over the hex 200 entries that we want to generate and we do this by giving your cookbook a name then we can define a size and we choose a very small size of this name and then we just give this a name. This, those values don't really matter. What just matters is that they are very small and by generating a lot of them we can fill all holes that were made in the heap structure before and basically you know get a new alignment for the heap pushing all the heap further down and we and and a, a certain chunk will not accidentally allocate it in a previous hole that was generated earlier from something else so this just fills up all the holes in the heap and when we have a new nice um, area where the next bug will be exploited Let's have a look at what is happening in this function uh, in GDB. So we start a new instance and attach to it with GDB. So first we go into the create recipe menu and then we call new recipe which will allocate a new recipe on the heap. And we can look at this in memory by going to this global variable that stores the current um, recipe that we are editing and we can then follow it and just look at it. Okay, here's the current recipe. Obviously it's all zero because we didn't do anything with the recipe. The next step is we give this recipe a name. This is also not particularly necessary. It just shows you where exactly would the name end up of a recipe if you specify one because that is important for the bug now. So if we look at this in memory, we can see where the name of this recipe is stored. Here we see our A's and B's and C's. In the next step, I also create another recipe and give it a name. This part is completely unnecessary, but I cannot remove it anymore because if I would remove it, then all the heap addresses or the objects would shift a little bit further uh, up and that would completely screw with um, the offsets and stuff that I calculate later. So it's unnecessary, but it's still in there it has nothing special. What is more important is the next step when we decide to discard this re last recipe that we have generated. We basically can ignore the first um, recipe that we have added because that will just will never be freed. It's just laying there on heap taking off, uh, taking off space. What is important is the second one we create. Now we discard the recipe that we have worked on recently. So the recipe got freed. Even though this got freed, like the other stuff that we did before, it doesn't look different. Like the first two values didn't get set to a weird value. That's actually because it was the last chunk. And if we look at the size of this particular recipe, it's not what we expect with the 411 or whatever it was. It's 1F9F9. And that is called the wilderness because this is now the end of the heap. We are literally, after that, there is no object allocated on it anymore. From here on, everything is just free heap. And the indication that we see this wilderness value there shows that this particular recipe got freed. Next we enter the add ingredient menu and then we allocate a new ingredient with n. Then we give this ingredient a name and we export saving it. So let's look at this in GDB. And the new ingredient should have been allocated where the recipe was previously at. And we can see this that now the wilderness pointer got moved a little bit further. We can see that it's now 1F8B1. It has slightly different value because obviously we have now a little bit less space on the heap because it got moved a little bit further down. Next we give this ingredient a name. And then we can look at this in GDB. So now we can see that the name got written where we expected it at offset plus eight. And just remember that the other two values are the calories and the price. And then we export, we save the changes. And it says saved. If you look closely, you may see that the name that was previously assigned to the recipe got overwritten with some other values. But what do they mean? Remember the functionality that we had to list all the ingredients that we have in the cookbook. And you can see that there's the ingredient that we just added. And you just ignore the other ones because in the exploit I would remove those but because we started uh, this as a fresh netcat session and not with the exploit they are still in there. But 
clearly there must be some kind of list and obviously a similar linked list as we have seen before and we know that there is a global variable that seems to keep the ingredient list so we can have a look at this list in gdb so the start of the list is pointed to by this global variable so let's follow this global variable Okay, we find another linked list entry and it's exactly how we had it earlier that the first one is pointing to an ingredient and the second one is pointing to the next entry of the list. And the next entry of the list is exactly below and so the, the you have again the pointer to an ingredient and then next to it is the pointer to the next entry. So you can see here, for example, this is one ingredient and if you print this again as strings, you can see that this is water and you, you can see the calories and the price for that water as well. And if we follow this linked list, eventually we will arrive at the ingredient that we have added last, which will have an empty next pointer. Especially this value this, uh, looks a bit weird. So yeah, that seems to be the um, ingredient that we have added last and you can see the axis that we have named it for. So let's have a look at where this um, list entry is located in memory. Let's have a look at the whole recipe again and see where we can find this one. So that's apparently at offset 758. And if we look in on the heap that was previously pointing from the recipe pointer, it's here. And if you remember, that's exactly at the location of the name from the recipe. So we can now, in theory, write another name to the recipe, which will overwrite the list entry of the ingredient list. Let's try this. Let's give this a recipe a name. So we go into the create recipe menu, G for give it a name and then some A's. And then we just look at in GDB again and see that indeed we have written there some A's, but it's just a little bit before the list. So we have to write some B's and C's. And then with the D's, we could overwrite the address of the next ingredient. And that's exactly what the exploit is doing. As you can see, I create a long string with A's, B's, and C's, and the D's would theoretically all write this address. And instead of an ingredient address, I write there the address I want to leak. Let's basically try this by hand. Let's continue again and create another name with A's and B's and C's and D's so that we have enough to actually overwrite the, uh, the ingredient list entry. So if we look at the heap now, we have successfully overwritten this address of this ingredient. And we can specifically just display this one list entry to verify it. We can see that this list entry is now pointing at an apparent ingredient at 44444. Now let's simulate an override with a chosen address by setting this particular address to this special number. In this case, we wanted to override it with the address of the printf global offset table address. But then we also have to set the second value as well to zero because if it's only a, then the algorithm will think that at address a is the next entry in the ingredient list. So we definitely want to set that to zero. So this is our fake ingredient list item. And after we have overwritten it, we will simply uh, quit the menu and then we will parse the ingredients. And parse ingredients will call L for list ingredients, which will follow the linked list and display each ingredient that is in this linked list. In this case, we still have the normal ingredients in there as well, but in the exploit, I remove them, if you remember. And here we can see our fake ingredient entry now. And you know that the calories number is exactly at the address where it is pointing to. So this global offset table entry is now interpreted as an ingredient which has calories of hex 476 something. And because the first bit is one, uh, it will be interpreted as a negative number if it's printed as a signed number. But we can use stou uh, signed to unsigned function that I've specified to convert this negative number to its unsigned counterpart. And we do this for all ingredients we find and then eventually return it. So now the first entry of this leaked array I'm returning will contain the address of printf from the global offset table. And then we can subtract from it the printf offset that we have specified. And when we run the exploit, we can see that this works well. 
we try to leak the address that is stored at the global offset table. After some heat grooming, we can leak it and uh, we get an address. And that is the address of printf. And then we can obstruct the offset and we get the libc base address. Okay, so cool. The exploit so far leaked the heap address and then proceeded to use a slightly different bug, but similar to leak the global offset table entry for printf, which we can use to calculate the ellipse base address, which will be important later. Unfortunately, the video gets longer than I expected. So I will split this again and in part three, we will finish the exploit. See you next time.